Hello and welcome. I'm Andrew Gleason from The Speaking Lions. This is the second video on God and Evil, part of our Thinking Out Loud series. A quick summary of where we got to in the first video. I introduced the basic ideas of the problem of evil as you standardly find them, especially in academic contexts, but certainly not only those. Um, it's in general, it's the problem of how to reconcile the existence of a omnipotent, omniscient, and perfectly good God with the existence of evil in the universe. And we looked at two basic lines of response to that argument from evil against God under the general heading of theodicy. And those two lines of response were greater good theodicy and free will theodicy. The general idea of greater good theodicy is that there are certain goods which make the world a better place than it would be without them. Goods such as compassion, um, charity, uh, courage, fortitude, and so on. And however, a, necessary, a logically necessary condition of those goods is the existence of certain types of evils. Suffering, for example. Forgiveness might be another good that makes the world a better place, but a necessary condition of forgiveness and reconciliation okay, is wrongdoing on someone's part. Wrongdoing of one person towards another person, so that the second person can forgive the first. And so on through many examples. The idea is that you can't have those goods without those evils. It's not logically possible to have those goods without those evils. And yet a universe that has both those goods and those evils together, okay, is a better place than a world which had neither. That at least is the basic thought. The goods are greater goods. They are goods which outweigh the evils which are unfortunately the inevitable and unavoidable cost of them. That's greater good theodicy. Free will theodicy was just the basic idea that evil in the world is due to the free choices of human agents and perhaps the agency of other created beings. I said in the first video that typically, for the most part, in discussions of the Odyssey appeals to free will actually take the form of or actually should be included under the general heading of greater good theodicy. That is the appeals to free will in most in most of the appeals to free will, the free will appears uh, as one of the greater goods of greater good theodicy. That is one of the great goods of the world is that human beings have free agency, that can make free choices, that we can choose between good and evil. It's part of the dignity or or importance of being human, that we have a kind of these moral choices that animals, other creatures, do not have, beasts do not have. And that makes human life especially significant. It also makes possible loving relationships between God and man, which must be entered into freely. It's not the sort of thing that can be compelled. Given that that is so, free will is a tremendous greater good, one of the most important and valuable of all the greater goods, probably the crown of greater goods. Uh, so on that kind of appeal to free will, free will, the free will response to the, pro to the problem of evil is just a version of the greater goods response. Now I think there is a form of appeal to free will which is, which is distinct and different from the greater good response, okay? It's the response which just basically says, where to blame, okay, stop blaming God. 
No mention of greater goods in that, okay, so far at least, anyway. It looks like it's a different kind of argument, a different kind of response. I'm not going to deal with that one here. In this video, I'll be, I'm going to be concerned exclusively with the greater good theodicy. And I'm going to argue that it's a profound failure. The, uh, the case against theodicy is greater good theodicy is so basic, so fundamental, that it's often referred to quite straightforwardly as anti-theodicy, a hostility to the very idea of theodicy. And that's what I'm going to present today. This line of thought is not original to me. Uh, you can find it in the work of many other important philosophers, including D.Z. Phillips, uh, um, Rowan Williams and my fellow Australian Nick Trikakis, among others. Okay. Um, perhaps I should say as well that what I'm presenting in this video is basically a summary of what I uh, present in chapter one of my book, um, A Frightening Love, uh, and I'll uh, link to that or give you the reference to that in the in the notes okay the greater good defense greater good defense or theodicy i'm not going to bother with the theodicy defense distinction here I'm just going to talk about it. i tend to use the words defense and theodicy interchangeable interchangeably okay now most academic discussions of the greater good uh, argument focus on criticisms like the following do these supposed greater goods really logically require these evils I mean for example does um, does uh, um, uh, a compassion really require suffering or does it require only the appearance of suffering or something like that? Okay, that would be one question. Is the amount and kind of evil that we find in the world necessary for the amount of good we find in the world? Is there a good for each evil or for most serious evils? Or are there some evils that are, as it were, unredeemed or pointless? I should mention here that not all versions of theodicy uh, greater good theodicy require there to be a good for each evil individually, just that there should be overall enough good to compensate for, for the evil. But that you know, detail need not concern us here. Are there higher order evils that don't have overbalancing goods? For example, if somebody is unrepentant or um, unappeased by someone else's forgiveness and continue in their malice or malevolence. Is there some overbalancing good that that creates? Or that that is a condition of? And if we see apparently pointless evil in the world, that is evil without greater goods, is it reasonable to draw the conclusion that probably God does not exist, that probably God does not exist, okay, given our ignorance of the world. How do we know, being the limited beings that we are, certainly in comparison to God, how can we be sure that there isn't some greater good out there that this evil is doing? Do we see enough of the picture to rule out this possibility? Can we even say, as a matter of probability, okay, that it is more likely that there is no such good than that, than that there is such a good? It's not clear that we can. Well, from the point of view of anti-theodicy, as Dewey Phillips has em emphasized, these objections are really quibbles over the details of the greater good framework. But it is the framework itself, the whole idea of greater goods that justify evils that must be questioned.
the central objection of anti-theodicy is a moral objection. Most of those uh, issues that I listed a moment ago uh, raise factual and epistemic questions about what is the case, about what we know to be the case, what we're justified in inferring, and so forth. But the real problem is not factual or epistemic. The real problem is moral. And the central objection is that the ends do not justify the means. Even if it's true that all these greater goods exist, even if it's true that the evils are a logically necessary condition for them, grant all of that, okay? Allow the, the theist, the defender of God, or the theodicist, okay, to, ha to have, grant him everything that he wants to claim about the existence of these greater goods. It's not going to matter to the moral objection. To the moral objection is <laughs> the lemon ain't worth the squeeze here. Who among us is to tell the parent of a drowned child that this was a price worth paying for the rest of us to develop and exercise our virtues or even to enjoy free will and a loving relationship with God? In the, before the burning children, will not these words ring hollow? Well, having an example before us may help to sober our minds. The one I'm going to quote here, which I used again in my book, is a famous one from fiction. But we should remember that it describes something which is common enough in the real world. This is Ivan Karamazov talking to his brother Alyosha from Dostoevsky's The Brothers Karamazov. And Ivan is putting to Alyosha, they're having a discussion about the problem of evil and Ivan puts this case to his brother. This poor child of five was subjected to every possible torture by those cultivated parents. They beat her, thrashed her, kicked her for no reason till her body was one bruise. Then they went to greater refinements of cruelty, shut her up all night in the cold and frost in a privy, and because she didn't ask to be taken up at night, as though a child of five, sleeping in an angelic sound sleep, could be trained to wake and ask, they smeared her face and filled her mouth with excrement, and it was her mother, her mother did this, and that mother could sleep, hearing the poor child's groans. And Ivan goes on, Can you understand why a little creature, who can't even understand what's done to her, should beat her little aching heart with her tiny fist in the dark and in the dark and the cold and weep her meek, unresentful tears to dear, kind God to protect her? Do you understand that, friend and brother, you pious and humble novice? Do you understand why this infamy must be and is permitted? Without it, I am told, man could not have existed on earth, for he could not have known good and evil. Why should he know that diabolical good and evil when it costs so much? Why the whole world of knowledge is not worth that child's prayer to dear, kind God. Well, what is implicit here in what Ivan is saying is what we might call Karamazov's challenge. Is it morally decent? Is it humane, compassionate? Is it consistent with goodness, let alone love, that this child suffer in this way in order to promote a more general good or even eventually her own good? Well, theodicists seem to think so. Indeed, they must say so. And they do. Now, I'm not going to name any names here, but 
Here are some actual examples in the literature which are intended to convince us of the propriety of the general idea of goods justifying evils. They point to examples that are common enough in human life. The point being to exhibit the general structure of the idea of goods justifying evils and to show that we already accept this principle in practice in much of our life. So here are three examples from the actual academic literature. One is of parents making a young boy in junior high school wear a daggy pair of short, hand, short, short pants to school even though he's going to be mercilessly teased by his fellow students. But this is good for him. It builds his character. He becomes a stronger human being by enduring this teasing. Good comes out of evil. Or in another example, a mother makes her child take, take piano lessons or go to school. Children often don't like taking their piano lessons or going to school, especially at first. And yet, in the longer run, it does them and others good. Once again, an evil, a good comes out of the evil, which justifies, in this case, the imposition, or in all these cases actually, not just the permission of an evil, but an imposition of it. And the third case is that of a parent sending their child to the dentist to correct something that's wrong with their teeth. I can remember going to the dentist as a young child and did not like it at all. Um, so, yeah, so, um, it can be uh, quite a frightening experience for some, some young children. Uh, and yet, okay, it's for their own good in the longer run. And once again, justifying good, okay, coming out of evil. But what do these examples actually prove? It's astonishing the speed with which the philosophers who put these examples move from the, these quite unexceptionable in instances to cases of serious evil. The cases exhibit the same abstract logical structure, an instrumental structure. Okay, The evil is a necessary condition of the good and the good justifies the evil. Now because the unexceptional cases have the same abstract logical structure, the instrumental structure, the means to end structure, as the serious case, it assumes that they simply leap to the conclusion that the moral justification is equally sound, as if the difference in the seriousness of the cases is irrelevant, as if somehow or other it doesn't matter, okay, that the one case is vastly more serious and the other, by comparison, is trivial. It's not accidental in this connection, okay, that I have to be frank and say that many of the examples that you find in the academic literature tend to be, you know, some of them even quote Dostoevsky, but in a purely decorative way. It's quoted, but it's never taken seriously as something which their theodicy needs to be held accountable to. Or else the examples are merely trivial ones of the sort that I've already listed. Now, to be fair, I must stress that not all theodicists are this crude. Some, for example, like John Hick or C.S. Lewis, rightly speak of how suffering can ennoble us. And of course that's true. Suffering can ennoble us. Okay? Um, and more importantly, how it can bring us to acknowledge our dependence on God and bring us into closer relationship with him. It can lead us into holiness. Now this is, as I say, this is true, profoundly true. And I have no desire to minimize its importance. Although, okay, it is also important to point out that it can just as often crush a person's faith in God crush 
their hope and faith and passion for life. And it's far from clear which is more common. But put that aside for the moment. It is true that suffering can can deepen us. As I say, I've no desire to minimise the importance of that. In fact, quite the opposite. Partly precisely because this idea is in true and important. Precisely because this idea is in true and important, I object to its vulgarisation by turning it into a justification of imposing or permitting the evils. This makes God out to be a kind of a tyrant, a lord who tortures his vassals to wring submission out of them. Now this point has been made uh, very forcibly online by Alex O'Connor, more commonly known perhaps as Cosmic Skeptic. And let's look at this, let's look at how he makes the point here. Is this not just the most mobster-esque observation you've ever heard? Hey, nice life you've got there. Comfortable job, loving family. It'd be a shame if I took it all away with a debilitating virus, just in case you forgot that I'm supposed to be the source of your happiness, not them. Dr. Bannister is suggesting that by allowing COVID to wipe out those earthly things in which we find happiness and meaning, we're reminded that all along, we should have been placing our trust and our happiness in God instead, and not these destructible earthly things. That is, God is willing to wipe out those things that bring us happiness and meaning, even going so far as to kill our friends and our family, or forcing them to undergo grief and hardship, just to remind us who's really in charge. It's as if God is saying, just in case you forget that I'm the one who deserves your attention and your worship, let me mercilessly kill and destroy those things that you love, just to remind you that you should have been focusing on me all along. Your happiness comes from me, okay? I don't even think about trying to get it from somewhere else. Well, uh, harsh words, you might say, but I think they're hard to avoid. The Odyssey seems to have to paint God as the godfather of a cosmic protection racket, trying to extort tribute from people rather than solicit it by love. And really, I mean, it is passing strange, I think, that people think the greater good story is making things better for God. <laughs> On the face of it, surely it makes them far worse for him. It implicates God directly in all the evils of the universe. Okay, you know, I mean, he did it. It's his fault. It's all part of his master plan for the universe. Imagine, you know, how appreciative of God is God going to be for this? Well, thanks, guys. Thanks a lot down there. Okay, just dump me in it. Um, you might think, with friends like this, does God need enemies? Well, it's important to see that the problem can't be solved or gotten around by simply ramping up the quantity and the quality of goods, especially you know, by appeal to the afterlife, which provides you with an infinite okay, uh, uh, capacity for that ramping up. That kind of response misses the point entirely, which, as Philip says, the problem is with the framework in principle and not the details. The anti-theodicist does not challenge whether or not the greater goods are forthcoming in this life or the next. Grant that they as reliably come forward as reliably as you want and as copious as can be. This is of no help. They do not justify doing what was done to the child in Dostoevsky's example, or allowing it to be done. 
And indeed, we might ask, it might, it might um, concentrate the mind to ask just what couldn't this way of thinking justify? Doesn't it issue a blank check? I mean, it, it already must justify, if it works, it's justifying all, either imposing or permitting, all the most horrendous things we see in this world. And if you can justify them, really, I mean, if you don't scruple at using theodicy to justify them, what are you going to scruple at justifying? What will you have scruples about? Where will you draw the line? We would not hesitate to condemn this behavior in a human being. Why should it be different with God? If God is just another instance, as theodicy assumes him to be, another instance of the same kind of moral agents we are, subject to the same standards of judgment, only on a larger scale, infinitely more powerful, more knowledgeable, good, and so forth, then why is something that is a vice in us, a virtue in him? Remember, it makes no difference here that he has so much greater knowledge and power, that he is so much more capable of achieving the outcomes. That difference, however vast, is irrelevant because it's the very idea of these ends justifying the means that is in question. And it's not only that the ends fail to justify the means. The moral power here is actually the other way around. The means corrupt the ends. The greater goods come with a moral cost, a burden borne by the person who enjoys them, a conscience haunted by the voices of the burning children. Or if you don't have such a conscience, it's at the price of making yourself unspeakably shallow and corrupt. If a person does benefit spiritually from other suffering, for example, by being courageous or charitable or whatever, I do not want to begrudge them that, far from it. If they benefit from their own, if one benefits from one's own suffering, I do not want to begrudge anyone that, God forbid. But we must protest if they or anyone else raises these greater goods into morally sufficient reasons for God inflicting or permitting serious suffering. It would be truer if those who benefited spiritually from suffering, their own or anyone else's, if they felt, particularly anyone else's here, I suppose, if they felt like Yankil Wiernik, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that name correctly. But he was a carpenter by trade who was forced to help the construct of the construct the machinery of killing in the camps of the Holocaust. He said, my life is embittered. Phantoms of death haunt me. Spectres of children, little children, nothing but children. I sacrificed all those nearest and dearest to me. I myself took them to the execution site. I built their death chambers for them. I don't know if he ever benefited spiritually from, from his experience, but if he did, it could only make this sentiment more astringent. What I'm suggesting here is that this, sent this sentiment is appropriate, okay, to be haunted by the burning children is appropriate not only for Wernick, who did evil himself, but is also appropriate to any of us who benefited from that evil. A further point about ramping up the greater goods. This typically involves postulating post-mortem compensation for the victims of evil, in which precisely because it is 
post-mortem and precisely because life after death is typically thought of as something going on infinitely. And there's no limit to the size and scope of the, the goods that can be, the, that can be bestowed. But once again, this kind of appeal makes things worse, not better. It really does treat the, it seems to me, I have to say, it really does seem to treat the lives of the, tree, the children as tradable commodities on sale to that theodicy or that world able to bid the most good for them. By contrast, Ivan Karamazov is in effect insisting that the lives of children are not for sale. No amount or kind of greater goods justifies creating a world where children suffer as they do in this one. And one might add that the same goes for adults as well. As Ivan says, Listen, if all must suffer to pay for the eternal harmony, what have children to do with it? Tell me, please. It's beyond all comprehension why they should suffer and why they should pay for the harmony. I renounce the higher harmony altogether. It's not worth the tears of that one tortured child who beat itself on the breast with its little fist and prayed in its stinking outhouse with its unexpiated tears to dear kind God. It's not worth it because those tears are unatoned for. They must be atoned for or there can be no harmony. But how? How are you going to atone for them? Is it possible by their being avenged? But what do I care for avenging them? What do I care for a hell for oppressors? What good can hell do since those children have already been tortured? I want to forgive. I want to embrace. I don't want more suffering. And if the sufferings of children go to swell the sum of sufferings which was necessary to pay for truth, then I protest that the truth is not worth such a price. Okay, that's the, that's the gist of the anti-theodicy. Let me finish on a few clarifications to try and, and anticipate and scotch any misunderstandings. I've already mentioned post-mortem compensation tailored to the individual victim, something that's been particularly emphasised by Merrill and McCord Adams. But once again, I want to point out that this... I've already said something about why this... Well, I've already said this makes things worse, not better. I should also add here that the idea is essentially wrong-headed. I'm not justified in torturing a child today or allowing that child to be tortured because next week I plan to compensate them, or because next week I will compensate them. And indeed, on the face, I mean, that should be self-evident, I think. And indeed, this would, have to be this would have to be compensation not just for injury, but for wrongdoing, for injustice. But if it's compensation for wrongdoing and injustice, then you weren't being perfectly good when you did it. And you can't be God as defined. Okay, the next clarification. It's irrelevant. Perhaps that was actually an additional anti-theodicy point rather than a clarification. But anyway, this is a clarification. It's irrelevant whether the evil is imposed by God or merely permitted by him. I mean, on the face of it, you might think that natural evil, such as earthquakes and um, tidal waves and disease and so forth, must be imposed by God, so they're not imposed by, by humanity. Uh, but some have suggested that um, perhaps natural evils could be the work, the, the, the exercise of other created beings exercising their free will in which case God never uh, imposes any of these evils uh, he merely permits them um, now it's true that 
uh, imposing the imposing, you know, uh, some great evil is typically worse than merely uh, permitting it. But permitting it is amply bad enough, okay? As, you know, if you just think again of the example of the child, if you had the opportunity to report these parents to uh, the authorities and to save the child and you didn't do it, that's amply bad enough especially if you're an omnipotent being who need expend no time or effort, according to the usual picture, to affect, to affect the world with perfect and achieve the outcome, save the child, to do all this immediately with, without expending any effort and with perfect success. It's also irrelevant whether the evil is an antecedent causal condition for the greater good, or whether it's a downstream consequent result of the greater good. So, in the case of uh, suffering as a necessary condition for compassion or courage or fortitude, um, the uh, suffering seems to be uh, prior to or at least uh, um, simultaneous with the compassion, the courage, the fortitude and so is a among the causal conditions for it. Whereas by contrast, you know, uh, in the case of um, uh, my doing a virtuous action uh, my doing an, sorry, an evil action, okay, by exercising my free will. It seems I first have the free will, okay, and then perform the evil action. Okay, so in this case, the evil is a result, not a cause. So in one case, we have evil causing good. In the second case, we have the good causing the evil. In both cases, okay, in the first case, the evil is a necessary condition of the good in the second it's the evil is a necessary consequence of the good um, or at least the possibility of the evil is the necessary consequence of the good because you don't by definition with free will you don't have to exercise your free will um, um, so, one case, evil causes good, and the other case, good causes evil or the possibility of evil. And when it happens, the actuality of evil. Uh, it doesn't matter, okay, the objection that the, that, it's not, so, put it this way, it's not just that the means does not justify, the end does not justify the means, the end does not justify the costs when they are results, okay. The evils when they are when they are the results of the good. Okay, the goods the goods uh, no more uh, are no more justifying when the evil is merely a result of them than when the evil is a necessary condition of them. Okay, either way, the goods do not justify the evils. Okay, I only raise this because some people uh, was someone once picked me up on it, and it seems to me to simply be irrelevant. Okay, uh, next clarification. Don't confuse securing a greater good with avoiding a greater evil. It is one thing to uh, lie to someone in order to uh, benefit someone else who's, uh, you know, really already in an okay position versus lying to uh, to the secret police about the whereabouts of the innocent fugitive that they're trying to hunt down and kill. Okay, So there's a difference between trying to improve a situation that's, you know, already not too bad, okay, versus trying to avoid a catastrophe or a disaster. 
We can certainly view the case of avoiding greater evils very differently, of you know, permitting or even imposing committing an evil in order to avoid a greater evil. We may certainly view that very differently from the case of committing or permitting evil in order to secure a greater good. Now I take no stand here, absolutist or, other, absolutist or otherwise, about whether or not it's justified to perpetrate serious evils in order to avoid greater evils. I, the anti-theodicist can remain agnostic on that question here. For God is not forced to allow the evil of this world in order to avoid some greater evil. He could avoid the evils of this world simply by not creating at all or creating a world with only inanimate nature and vegetation. Neither of those scenarios is evil at all, let alone an evil greater than all the evil of this world. When he creates sentient life, he is not avoiding a greater evil, but he's making a not bad situation, the created world, better. Or trying to, he may actually make it worse, but that's another matter. The moral is that anti-theodicy is not committed to any kind of debatable moral absolutism. It says that you never do anything uh, bad uh, though the heavens fall. Okay. Um, finally, I just want to mention that, um, or not final, this is the penultimate point. Um, there are versions of theodicy or something parallel to greater good theodicy of an aesthetic sort. These give the appearance of being somewhat more sensitive or subtle than mainstream theodicy. They will often compare the world to artistic works. So a painting may be a greater painting because of the contrast between light and darkness and shadows, okay? good and evil. I hope I'll leave it as an exercise for the viewer themselves to think through how the kind of objection that I've given to standard greater good theodicy also applies to the aesthetic versions. There's a very fine paper about the aesthetic version of theodicy, a very fine critique of it by Rowan Williams, and I'll uh, I'll um, give a reference to that in in the notes. Okay. Okay, to wind it all up. This looks like it might be the end of the road for God. Well, um, okay, uh, but anti-theodicy does not necessarily equal anti-God. First of all, there is, as I mentioned at the start and in the first version, uh, and in the first video, there is a form of uh, the appeal to free will which is not a version of greater good thinking. It's not that kind. And I'll need to deal, uh, deal with that in a separate video at some stage. But let's put that aside again for the moment. Supposing that greater good theodicy was the only serious contender here, If this objection to greater good theology is as powerful as I believe it to be, then does it not vindicate a logical version of the problem of evil? Where is there for God to go? How can he escape? If there's any evil, certainly any serious evil in the universe at all, and there is, okay, then doesn't this objection that the end does not justify the means, does not justify, okay, making things better, okay, as, a, as opposed to avoiding a greater evil. Does not this basically vindicate a logical, the logical form of the problem of evil? Is this not the end of the road for God? Well, no, not necessarily. In fact, it might be the beginning of a deeper understanding of God and of good and of evil. Maybe we need to question the assumptions behind what is sometimes called the God of the philosophers as opposed to the God of the Bible and of faith. 
and I hope that we'll I'll be getting into that in videos to come though uh, I should warn you <laughs> uh, and myself that the going is going to get much harder uh, and I am not at all confident uh, that I know the way uh, I'm going to be as the title for the series says I'm going to be thinking out loud and uh, just where my thinking is going to take me. I have a general idea, but I'm not entirely confident. I hope it's not going to be a case of the blind leading the blind, and I may well need your help, and I hope I can get it. So far, we've only scratched the surface of things. We're just at the beginning. Anyway, thank you very much. Uh, hit that like button to improve the greater good. Uh, subscribe, and uh, Hopefully I'll see you again soon. Okay, cheers.